Today on the One Peter Five podcast, we announce the publication of a new catechism explained by one of our authors, Matthew Pleasy. Hello, this is Timothy Flanders. Jesus is King. This is the One Peter Five podcast, rebuilding Christendom, restoring Catholic culture and tradition. I'm very happy to have my friend Matthew Pleasy with us. Matthew, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great, Timothy. How you been? I'm doing fantastic. What, so you uh, you've been posting on Facebook your your various marathons lately. So you, do you, what was the last country you got back from running a marathon in? Uh, I ran the Berlin Marathon this year in the fall. Um, it finished in about three and a half hours. So really happy about that. That's my best time so far. And actually, just yesterday, I got news. I've been accepted into the Chicago Marathon uh, in October. So I'll be doing that. But in the meantime, I got Miami Marathon coming up in January. And I'm running the London Marathon in April. But I'm needing to raise some money for charity. I'm running for the Catholic Children's Society of the United Kingdom. So that's going to be on St. George's Day. Oh, that, oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. So those of you who do not know Matthew, he has been writing for a number of different publications, Fatima Center, Catholic Family News. Uh, and we're talking about his book that is a is a published version of his one of his series at Catholic Family News. And we're really happy to have him at One Peter Five, which he started writing about a year ago. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Matthew, uh, for those who are not familiar with your work? Yes, I'm happy to. So I've been working with uh, writing online Catholic news publication articles from basically 2005, 2006 until the present. So I started my work by writing for the blog A Catholic Life, uh, which I still write at today. My focus the past couple of years there has really gone into fasting and absence research and making that kind of forgotten traditions and, and history made available to more people. So I still write for there. Um, and then in 2010, I was um, hired and brought on to be the president of catechismclass.com. Um, and thankfully, you know, really by the grace of God, we've been able to grow substantially, making available great courses for parishes, individuals, homeschoolers, really anybody. If you want to learn more about the Catholic faith, no matter if you are brand new to our faith or you're a lifelong Catholic, there's resources for you. So I've been working uh, in that initiative now for over 13 years uh, to make the best of Catholic faith formation available to other people. And then in 2018, I was uh, brought on as a writer for the Fatima Center and Catholic Family News, started on both uh, projects in January of 2018. And that's really where this book started. It started in that uh, contract that I got in January 2018 uh, when uh, Matt Gaspers asked me to join Catholic Family News and write a monthly piece going through the Roman Catechism. So it's really been four years in the making to come here today and talk about this book. So Excellent. That's fantastic. So yeah, we're going to talk all about uh, your, your new book, Roman Catechism Explained for the Modern World, published by Our Lady of Victory Press. So we'll get into that in just a minute. I just want to I want to ask you about some of that stuff as well. I just want to remind everybody we're we're still in our year end fundraiser at One Peter Five. We are we had our spring fundraiser. It we we raised some money, but I think due to a lot of economic situations, we still are in need of a lot more funds for the year end fundraiser. So please give at onepeterfive.com slash donate, especially monthly donors. That's what we really need. Um, but be, so let's get back to your book. Um or before we get into your book, actually, I wanted to ask you about catechismclass.com. So mm -hmm. you actually did not start that organization. Um, can you tell us more about that and what catechismclass.com offers? Yes. Yeah, so, no, I am not the founder. The founder of catechismclass.com is Father James Adelava, a really a, a visionary for his time. Because in 2004, he looked at the advent of the Internet and he said, how do I use modern technology? How do I use the Internet to reach more people? Uh, to make available the best in online Catholic learning? How do I reach parents who are too busy to bring their children to CCD? How do I reach people who want to learn about the faith before they enroll in RCA programs or people who are too busy to attend one? How do I give parents the resources to make the best in homeschooling available? So uh, various initiatives like that. So Father Zadalava started our programs at that time in 2004. And uh, he led the organization until I came on. I came on as a writer in 2007. And then I ultimately took over for him and some others in 
2010. Father Zedlava, um, he he died in 2018. So if uh, if you're listening, if you could please say a re- uh, prayer for uh, the repose of his soul. Uh, we're still very much indebted to his work, though. We continue to make available the courses that that he wrote, and we continue to make available new things. So we are leaders in online baptism preparation for parents and godparents, uh, traditional marriage preparation classes for couples, um, everything from that to catechist training. We we train priests and deacons in our programs as well to make them more formed. A number of adult courses, children's courses, whether it be sacramental prep or niche things like apologetics or eschatology or the precepts of the church. We have courses on all of those uh, and much more. So on our website, you can click at the top under shop and then you could see our complete catalog. There's a number of different items there. But uh, yes, it does start with Father Zanilava's vision of how do you make the best available using modern resources. And he said the internet was a moral um, neutral topic. You know, there can be good to come out of the internet. And we've really been blessed to help quite literally tens of thousands of students enroll in and complete courses, whether it be liturgical year courses like this Advent course that we're advertising right now, or people who uh, thankfully wanted to complete their confirmation after growing up and never doing so, same thing with First Communion. We've even had people in their 70s and 80s take courses who are quite literally Catholics their whole life who just wanted to take some time to learn a little bit more. And um, they actually wrote to us to say that they learned things that they were never taught their entire life, going to Mass every Sunday, going to Catholic school all 12 years. So we're very blessed to be able to have a, an impact on so many different people. That's fantastic. So, so you, so this program, catechismclass.com, is used by various parishes or dioceses, and you are a catechist. What does that mean exactly in terms of your official status in the ecclesiastical uh, official programs? Mm-hmm. So, um, there, there are quite a number of dioceses around the country, as well as internationally, that recommend our courses, that have it on lists of recommended courses, but. In the world of online Catholic education, there's no such thing as accreditation. There's no such thing as this is the list. So, I mean, really any priest can direct people to the resources that he wants. A number of dioceses have already directed people to us. A number of priests do as well. We're blessed to have a number of different people who have supported our work over the years. Uh, Dr. Scott Hahn endorsed us very early on. Carl Keating also very early on and others. We uh, produce and uh, we make available our resources as well with the permission of the Vatican, uh, the Vatican's library. We have a contract with them in order to do so, which we renew uh, as needed. So we have their support. A number of bishops as well have explicitly come out to support our work, like Cardinal Burke, um, who supports the work that we do to make the best of traditional Catholic formation available to as many people as possible. So. Uh, we do, as a result, work directly with a number of parishes. Um, quite another uh, large amount of parishes simply refer people to us and say, hey, you should check out this to further your faith formation. And then we have still a great number of parents, individuals who just browse the internet and find us and become our students that way. You know, we try to make everything available for a very affordable price. Most things are, you know, 20 to $30 or so for these courses. So this is not something like a, you know, an education that you would pay thousands of dollars for. We We try to provide really great courses, very well researched, accessible, easily available online 24 seven. And and we do so for a very moderate price. Excellent. Um, Now, Matthew, I first got exposed to your work at your blog, catholiclife.blogspot.com, I think, right? Correct. Yeah. A a Catholic life, that blogspot. Yeah, a Catholic life. And this is the thing that really struck me about your work. Uh, and you, here you have the book here, mm-hmm. was that you just provide the splendor of truth, really. Uh, that This is what I love about your blog, is that you don't really follow after a bunch of sensational topics, things that are you know hot topics nowadays in the trad world. You just prevent, present the splendor of the faith. And this is something that always struck me about this, but this is you know just not something that's uh, very popular. Because mm-hmm. I think that we this is this is our spiritual malady, you know, uh, even among the trads, you know, who, you know, we claim to be the most faithful, per se, to the traditions of the church. But I, even among trads, there's there's a, a lack of interest in sort of just 
the the hardcore truths of the faith. Um, can you speak at all to that uh, in the online world? You know, you're presenting just the faith, um, but mm -hmm. what is most popular are these sensational topics. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, unfortunately, I think I think you're really correct in that. Um, so I, I blog as well. On if you go to Twitter, I'm the a Catholic Life handle, and I think it's particularly profound on Twitter. I see it though on Facebook. I see it in other different platforms. People are gravitating towards sensational stories. What's what's the you know the worst parish somebody's photographed and liturgical abuse is going on? What is the sensational headlines about politics? What is going on in churches around us or even in the traditional community, other, you know, leading figures, you know, causing scandal or somebody accusing someone of something. I, I don't get involved in that. Uh, that's never been my focus. I don't think that's my mission. I think it's a distraction. Uh, yeah, I've mentioned um, before, I was, I was mentioning to you before that uh, my conversations, for instance, with Steve from Census Fidelium, we, we talk about that, how we just like providing the splendor of truth. This is the faith. This is what it means to live a Catholic life. Here's here's the fasting. Here's the holy days. Here's the prayers. Here's the ethos. Here's good things to read. How do you actually improve your spiritual life? And there's so many other stories you could talk about, um, whether it be COVID related, whether it be liturgical abuses, whether it be ongoing happenings at the Vatican. And for me, that's just a distraction from my mission of how do I help people live a Catholic life and learn the Catholic faith and practice it? Because when you die and you go to judgment, you're going to be held accountable to how you lived your life. Did you observe the commandments? Did you observe everything our Lord asked? Did you know the faith? Did you teach it to your children? He, our Lord doesn't care if we know about who might be the next cardinal or not. There's rumors going on, you know. It just it's just such a distraction, really. So I don't focus on it really at all. And I never have. And honestly, I don't think I ever will. Yeah, I, I mean, that that's a great thing to uh, equalize everything when we consider the judgment and we consider the four last things as we do in Advent. It really just puts everything into perspective. Um, can you comment at all on your work on the Internet? Because this is something that I've I've certainly um, struggled to maintain a balance uh, wanting to use the Internet for good, because there's so much potential for good, as your founder at catechismclass.com originally saw. I myself was converted to the faith because I had contacts as an Eastern Orthodox Christian with true Catholics who were hardcore on the faith through the internet. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much potential for good by the internet. But uh, I think that trads who are really serious about the faith and want to improve their spiritual life are probably not on Twitter. And uh, certainly not to knock anybody who's on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm simply saying, you know, people make comments about the trad movement. They say, oh, the trads are mean or whatever. Um, but I think most trads are probably just getting on with their spiritual life and they just don't have time for for Twitter or whatever. So the, mm -hmm. the Internet, the Internet sort of tradosphere and on the Internet has sort of a, um, a preponderance of the sensational uh, because people who go there are making that popular. Any any comments on the Internet's uh, strengths and weaknesses? Thoughts on that? Yeah, a few things. One, I think, you know, with the Internet and with a lot of things other than sin, really, it's all things in moderation. So mm -hmm. the Internet, I think, is a very effective tool. Of course, don't let yourself get, you know, enraptured into it. Don't let yourself become so beholden to it that that's all you're doing. You know, as I was reading, you know, in spiritual reading. So every day I try to start with spiritual reading. I try to do the divine office throughout the day. Those are centers. There's a time to close things and come back. But as I was reminded during spiritual reading yesterday, if if you, you know, take the time to pray, but you don't silence your mind and your mind is still in your work or what's going on, you're really robbing God of the time you set aside for him. It's really theft. It's really mm -hmm. theft from God himself who who we, you know, if we can set aside time to pray, which we should, these are relatively small amounts for most people, you know, five minutes here, 10 minutes there, 20 minutes there. And if you can't do that because you're so engrossed in what's going on on Twitter or something else or messages and you can't silence it, that's robbery. So the practical aspects of keeping the phone away in the morning until you complete your meditation and the divine office same thing with mass, try to resist the urge, try to silence it, turn off the vibration so you don't even feel it, put it away. 
I think those those can be really effective. And the second thing I would say too is it depends on everybody's vocation and mission. So everybody is really called to be a missionary in their own lives. I've talked about that before. How even though we have St. Francis de Sales as a patron of missions, obviously prolific, baptized more people than anybody else other than St. Paul, you know, did did tremendous work. And at the same time, and the um, the Holy Father, when he named St. Francis de Sales patron of the missions, he also named his co-patron St. Therese of Lisieux, who mm. obviously died in a convent at a young age, was never a missionary, wanted to be, never set foot in mission territory, never baptized a single person, never heard a single confession. But he equated that because you have the one who's prolific as a missionary and the one who is the spiritual powerhouse supporting the missionaries. And I think very much in our own lives as, as lay Catholics, we're all called to be missionaries. But which kind of missionary? Maybe some of us are called to engage with technology more online. Maybe some of us are called to write apologetically and, and to combat errors that way. Maybe some of us are not qualified. Maybe our, our vocation is more reading the good content like one Peter five puts out and sharing it with other people and going from there, making sure your family is well formed, teaching your children and correcting people in your day to day life and being a missionary that way. So I don't think everybody's called to be on Catholic Twitter, but I think some people are. And I, but no matter if you are or not, it's important to center it because if people who like Fulton J. Sheen were, you know, so busy, found time every single day to make a holy hour. I think no matter who you are, you have to find that time and carve it out and set it aside. Doesn't mean that is, you know, Catholic Twitter or really anything online is for everybody. But I think everybody can and should engage with the Internet in some extent, because the Internet, like the printing press at its time, was new. How do you use it for good? And obviously, well, like the Internet, the printing press, whatever technology we have, it can be used for good. Uh, again, in moderation. Yeah, well said. Well said, as always. Wesley says he has really appreciated the Forgotten Customs articles by you, Matthew, which have been a wonderful help to live the faith for myself and my wife and young children. Yeah, I, I happily concur to that. I, I we've I've already talked with Matthew about possibly publishing that as a as a, a separate book because I, I think the customs are so critical. But based on the vocation that you just said, what would you say to critics, Matthew, who say and now getting into your book here, um, mm -hmm. critics come along and say to trads, well, you you have no business catechizing, uh, you know, being a public voice talking about the faith. That's the job of the church, they say. When they when they say church, they mean only the hierarchy. Um, what are you? What are your response to tri critics of the trad movement who say things like, "We shouldn't have our our nose in all these things of the faith"? What do you think about that? About that? Well, I think a few things. One, obviously, we are in a period of crisis. There is a deep crisis not only in modern society but in the church. And I think as time goes on, the more people who fail to see that are really blind intentionally because it's it's rather evident the spiritual crisis we find ourselves in and we're very much in a catechetical crisis too we have been for a long time vatican II in that period obviously pushes over the edge but we we were really going downhill in the decades even before vatican II. whether it came to living out the faith acquiescing really as an american society to uh protestants around us so um it's really if somebody looks at something and says, I can make a difference. I am, you know, properly prepared. I am educated to do so. I don't think one needs to really be, you know, for instance, a bishop or a priest in order to do so. One is qualified if one knows the faith. And uh, secondly, I would say it really is a spiritual, you know, work of mercy. We forget that admonishing the sinner, uh, catechizing others, pointing out uh, the wrongs others do. We, we can very much make a difference in people's lives if we're just not so timid and we go out there and we properly, you know, share the, the fruit that we've received. So I am a uh, third order Dominican. So um, I've been blessed to be a member really of the Dominican order in that capacity. Um, and as a result, I often think about the, the rule that I follow, the traditional rule from 1923. And uh, part of that is the really the vocation of a Dominican is to write, you know, and to share and to study. And uh, one of the models of the Dominican order is contemplaria contemplara, you know, to contemplate and to share the fruit of your contemplation. 
So one does that really in Dominican capacity by writing, by speaking, and by being very active in, in those academic disciplines. But unfortunately, I feel like you can have two extremes. You can have people who say, oh, I'm not going to get involved at all. It's not my, not my job, not my business. Or we do have great theologians in the church, maybe not, not a lot, but there's definitely some. Um, and certainly the Dominican order has some. But I feel like a lot of what they write is just so over the top of everybody's head. It has to be brought down to the basic understanding because we're in a crisis right now. Not everybody can read, you know, Garigou Lagrange and understand it. I mean, you're going to need to have a translation, really. And when these great theologians are writing things at beyond a master's level, really a PhD level, that's not going to help the average family, the average Catholic, the average person who wants to know, well, what, what is the faith? How do I learn it better? How do I teach it? How do I live it out to please our Lord? So that, that's where I tend to focus more. Uh, that's what I'd like to do. Yeah, totally. I, 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 this was one of the quotes that you brought out in the very first pages of your text, which I thought was fantastic, was Leo XIII Sapientiae Christiane from 1890, which he says, quote, no one must entertain the notion that private individuals are prevented from taking some active part in this duty of teaching, especially those on whom God has bestowed gifts of mind with the strong wish of rendering themselves useful. Such cooperation on the part of the laity has seemed first to the Vatican of the first Vatican Council so opportune and fruitful of good that they thought well to invite it. Let each one therefore bear in mind that he both can and should, so far as may be, preach the Catholic faith by the authority of his example and by open and constant profession of the obligations it imposes, end quote. So long before the, the Second Vatican Council, in terms of the laity that, that or the universal call of holiness, things like that, there has always been this, uh, in the modern period, this push for the laity to also be involved in some catechetical or preaching of the Catholic faith. Uh -huh. yeah. um, now, this brings out uh, what you just said, brings out the necessity for the Roman Catechism explained. Now, I, I have here the this is the Roman Catechism. Uh -huh. uh, it's a very large text. This this edition has uh, it's almost 600 pages. This is the Tradivox edition. Shout out to Tradivox putting together uh, hundreds of or the hundreds of catechisms that have been out since the, the first Peter Canisius version in the 1500s Roman Catechism. And the Roman Catechism Explained by Spirago was published short, almost in 1900. I think it was 1899. Mm -hmm. so that was explaining the Roman Catechism in the around the year 1900. And your book comes out explaining the Roman Catechism in our day. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak at all to placing the Roman Catechism uh, in the context of all the catechisms? Uh, some people think that the newest catechism is sort of the catechism. People say the catechism when they quote mm -hmm. it. Um, can you speak at all to catechisms? Uh, the Roman catechism is, would you say the Roman catechism is sort of the the standard of all catechisms? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the Roman catechism is truly the definitive catechism. It is the catechism which we have as a result of the Council of Trent. And we obviously know Trent's focus was very much dogmatic. It was combating the Protestants. It was putting together a true compendium of this is the Catholic faith. Now, there are other catechisms, and that's why I'm really glad to see Tradivox doing what they do. And, and others are becoming more aware because, unfortunately, a lot of these other catechisms have gone out of print. Um, we have, you know, Father George Hayes' uh, catechism. We have um, the Penny Catechism. More people are familiar with the Baltimore Catechism. You have the Canisius uh, as well. I mean, there's there's dozens of catechisms. So the, the notion that the catechism is simply referring to the 1992 text is simply absurd. Um, and I even talk about uh, very much at the beginning of the book and in some of the descriptions that the modern catechism is is so hard to read you cannot possibly give that to a child and say this is the catholic faith learn it so it just doesn't work that way there's different catechisms for different audiences there are some catechisms that were more focused on combating protestant era so they rely more on scripture there were others that wanted to use reason a bit more there were others that were meant to be very quick and to the point you can memorize the basics of the faith and there are others that you would go to for much more information now the roman catechism which we also know of as the Catechism of the Council of Trent, uh, is this catechism. It is the catechism that is truly the definitive catechism, I believe, and, and it very much still is. 
Unfortunately, though, as you pointed out, that catechism is rather long. And as 500 years has gone on, while the faith never changes, dogmas don't change. Sure, some additional ones were defined, but everything that was set forth in there as this is the faith still is true. But unfortunately, if you were to give that to somebody, it would generally be too difficult to understand. Number one, it's too long. And two, some of the analogies in there, the descriptions how, are simply uh, out of reach for the, the average Catholic. And three, there's been a large amount of modern errors that have come into our world. How, how do, can we use the principles of the faith that are in the Roman catechism? How do we combat socialism? How do we combat the rise of secularism? How do we combat modernism and all of these other isms that have affected our world today? We do that by applying the principles, the teachings of the church, which are really rooted in that catechism to the modern world. That's what I kind of sought out to do. I wanted to make available initially for Catholic Family News, uh, their subscribers, and now for everybody else, this series of articles going through chapter by chapter, presenting here's what the Catechism says, here's applications to it, augmented by the Baltimore Catechism or the Catechism of St. Pius X or these other catechisms we mentioned because there's, they all are teaching the same faith, but sometimes they say things in different ways. That's why one of the one of my favorite stories, really, of my time at catechismclass.com comes from a woman who she told me she was in her early 80s. And she said she had been Catholic her whole life, and she obviously knew what purgatory was, but she said she couldn't quite grasp exactly what it was. She couldn't explain it. She knew generally. She said she read a number of catechisms over the years, but it was only after seeing several of them put side by side, it clicked. And that's one of the things we do at catechismclass.com. We don't just use one catechism. We use a blend of different ones. Because while the faith is the same, explaining it can be different from this one versus that one. And she read one that she had never read before, and she said it clicked. And that's really what I've sought to do in this book, too. This is not a replacement for the Roman catechism. There's nothing to replace. This is taking that text, applying it to our modern world, to our century, to the crisis we're in, and making sure it's digestible and understandable for today's Catholic, whether you're a new Catholic, a lifelong one, a parent, a priest, a director of religious education, I want to make the Roman Catechism more accessible for everyone. And that's what this series of articles in this new book is about. Yeah, I just I want to ask you to comment one more time on the newest Catechism. And because I think you really put it well, if we even just if we set aside the doctrinal controversies and just assume that there's just perfect orthodoxy and nothing really ambiguous, I, I really do agree with you when you comment and say, I mean, this is this is really uh, undergraduate level stuff. Uh, I mean, and there's many passages in the New Catechism that I, I, I appreciate, I think, are, are a beautiful way of saying things. But uh, it, it's it doesn't really function very well as your catechism for you know, catechizing the youth, uh, the mm -hmm. young children. Um, and where can you comment at all more about that? And where do you see your book as in terms of what demographic do you are you targeting in particular? Mm -hmm. So for this book, I'm really targeting um, because the Roman Catechism is obviously written at an adult level. These are primarily going to be high school or up. It's going to be high school, college, adult. This is also going to be something that a parent could could read and then digest themselves and share it with their family. Um, I've definitely incorporated a lot of passages from the Roman Catechism in here, as you can attest to, but I've tried to augment it by explanations. And those explanations are going to be what, uh, what a child is going to be more easily able to, uh, to, to understand. But it's really for everybody because the faith is for everybody. So I think really any family, yeah, any adult could benefit from this. Now, as you mentioned, the new catechism, it, it's rather interesting because, yeah, setting aside those doctrinal uh, differences and ambiguities or um, controversies, whether it be with the, the death penalty or anything else in that text, it's just simply too hard to read. And um, I don't think I'm the only one who, who, who would come to that conclusion. For instance, one of the 
the reasons why in my work at catechismclass.com, we were very keen on, we need to, we, we do use the new catechism in, in parts throughout for adults, but we always augment it with other catechisms. So you can see what is getting at and try to understand it. And one of the reasons we did that was, um, you know, we, we looked to really what uh, Pope uh, Benedict XVI, when he was Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, uh, he made some comments actually in 2003, where he really lamented that, uh, the religious ignorance today, calling it enormous, saying it's a suffice to speak with the new generations. He said, evidently, in the post-conciliar period, the concrete transmission of the contents of the Christian faith is no longer being achieved. Uh, he said this after, obviously, the 1992 catechism was out. He also said the catastrophic failure of modern catechesis is all too evident. This is now well over a decade after this publication. He's talking about the crisis in in um, the really the faith in catechesis. So the problem is the target audience for this catechism, I do believe, that is the 1992 catechism, I would really say that's a much higher level. That's going to be your master's level or higher. This is something where you're going to really have to, to know how to read it. Now, there are some great passages in there, especially as it concerns the pro-life movement for the for the evils of abortion, things that are not right. spoken yeah. of as explicitly in the Roman Catechism, but, right. but are in there. This does a much better job at that, or at in vitro fertilization, or at cloning. I, those passages I would definitely refer people to, but if I were to hand you a book, like unfortunately I knew some priests would do, and they say, you're new to the faith. Do you want to know what the faith is about? Here's the Catechism. I mean, where would you even begin? It's so hard. How do you read it? How do you make sense of it? It's really, I believe, a master's level or higher. Now, my book is, as I said, it really meant to bridge the gap of really anybody at an adult reading level to be able to get a lot out of it. You're not going to walk away saying, I needed a PhD to read that. And that's one of the problems with the writing of the new catechism. Again, setting aside doctrinal issues. Yeah, I, I, that's what I think is is such a great value of your book is that this is the perfect book to give to a Protestant convert, you know, somebody who's new to the faith or even, like you said, a revert, like somebody who's coming back to the faith. Definitely uh, one of the best just basic ABC introduction to the Catholic faith. I, I, I would definitely take this one first. Again, setting aside any issues with this, but... Um, can we get into some of those issues, though? Uh, you mentioned some of some of them in your Roman Catechism book. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the particular things that are being taught either in the the official new catechism or just generally today um, that are errors that need to be corrected? Well, one of the problems with the new catechism is really what it does not teach. And that's a, what I've really tried to seek out. So the, obviously the new catechism was, was written in the 90s. It was put out in the 90s, long after modernism has set in, long after the years of communism and socialism. Uh, of course, we, we have new issues uh, affecting us in our world today. You know, we have the transgender issues affecting the world and the church. And we, we have the Germans bishops and, and the controversies they cause with everything. Uh, but the problem that we see in a lot of the church's official teachings right now is ambiguity in terms of, I don't want to offend somebody. I don't want to be too bold. I, I don't want to assert what has always been taught. For instance, I don't, I don't believe or, uh, the new catechism talks at all about Freemasonry, but I, I, can't, I can't say for sure. But if it does, it's going to be very weak in that regard. Whereas um, that was one of the most condemned institutions ever in the church's history. I, we could cite 15 or so different official papal documents on that. And if something is that heinous, why is it not being mentioned with that same degree in the new catechism? And it definitely, even if it is mentioned in there, it's not going to be mentioned in, in that um, extent. So what it, the new catechism doesn't explain is almost uh, a large part of the problem. So, yeah, that, I just looked at the index of the new catechism. It's not in the index. So I don't know if it's... Yeah. <laughs> mentioned in passing it's very yeah it's certainly something uh, and it's a modern era since the roman catechism that mm -hmm. as you say it's yeah definitely one of the most uh condemned organizations mm -hmm. um i certainly see uh, that that's a really great thing you just said because you know a lot of these errors 
people get into huge debates over whether or not these errors exist in the new catechism or not, or whether or not they're in Vatican II or not. But I think what you just said is even more conspicuous. What is not said, what is, they're just silent about it. Um, mm -hmm. I think of um, certain things about the marriage, the sacrament of marriage, which are not said, they're just silent. They're just kind of passed over. Um, like things regarding feminism, for example, are just sort of passed over. They're not really commented on. Um, but are extremely important things that are mm -hmm. going on in the more modern world, which are just not addressed. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Any what 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 in anything that came out in writing this book that was of particular significance that you really think is extremely important that people need to know about? Well, um, you know, I've been working with apologetics and and Catholic, you know, catechism courses now for really over 15 years. So the, the point that I keep coming back to in a lot of my work is really part of my motto with catechismclass.com is the words of St. Paul, I became all things to all people to save at least some. And, and I see this with, I feel like unfortunately too much with uh, religious education programs is um, if you don't fit my model, then, then I don't care if you learn or not. If you can't come to my class on time, if, if you're not exactly molded to the way I want you to be. Unfortunately, people learn at different paces. People learn different ways. Some people learn written, some people learn uh, auditorily, some people learn, learn visually. Everybody's different and everybody comes from a different background. If you coming from an Eastern Orthodox background is different from somebody who comes from a Hindu background, is different from somebody who was raised as a Southern Baptist, uh, obviously you have to adapt. And unfortunately, I don't feel like a lot of work out there is easily adaptable um, because of the way religious education programs are today. Now, the Roman Catechism can be adaptable. You can take it and you can teach different things that people need to focus on. Or for instance, the Catechism does a wonderful job going through all of the articles of the Creed. Who is our Lord? How do we know he is divine? And how do we know he is fully man? And going through all of those articles. And, and taking those and applying them to modern eras. For instance, we can talk about the eras of Islam because Islam asserts, you know, that our our Lord um, was, was not God, that he did not actually die on the cross. So we can to apply some of the teachings from the catechism to eras people know uh, and hear of today, to other religions, to combat that. That's not something done in the modern catechism. It is not something I see really done at all. So what I sought to do and what the Roman Catechism does is it really details a beautiful and systematic study of this is the faith. This is the creed. These are the Ten Commandments. These are uh, the words from the Our Father. Applying those to our lives, to the errors we see and to our own individual situations. So I think if you are a parent, if you are a director of religious education, if you are a priest, a deacon, get the book, and then maybe not everybody needs to read every pa uh, passage, every chapter. Um, that's also, I think, uh, how to become a better reader is you don't have to feel compelled if you got if you get a book to necessarily finish it. Uh, that maybe this book, you know, I do think you can get a lot out of it, but you don't have to read absolutely everything. You can skim the index and you can see what issues a student of yours, for instance, or a child might first need to focus on most. And, and that's one thing that I do when, when I help bring people to the faith is what's your background, what, what seems to be the sticking point or the issues, and let's go into those. Let's address those. There's so many modern errors right now. There's so many uh, things going on. Really, all part of this crisis in the church is crisis in society, and, and obviously, you can't have a one-size-fits-all approach to everything. Bringing the faith to as many people as possible, saving as many as possible, is, is part of that missionary spirit that I think should characterize every single person and being adaptable and being genuine and being, of course, generous and kind and patient. We, we don't have to be mean about it. You know, we, we do so to share the faith and the splendor of truth with everybody. That's great. That's an interesting, uh, another aspect of the Roman Catechism, which sets it apart from the New Catechism is in its adaptability to all sorts of different pedagogical situations. Um, Cosmic Pilgrim has a comment uh, talking about creed, cult, and code. He says that lex vivendi, the code, the, the way of life, must be preceded by the lex celebrandi, the cultus, the, the liturgy. 
Um, can you comment at all, Matthew, on the relationship between, uh, I, I know, and I know that in this text you wrote, it also talked about our father. So there's also a sort of a liturgical aspect to this too. Can you talk at all about the relationship of these, the Lex Credendi, Lex Vivendi, and right. the Celebrandi? Yeah, you know, the law of prayer is the law of belief. So I've always believed and emphasized that they go hand in hand. I can teach you the faith. I can, you know, here's what the faith has. These are all of the dogmas of the faith. Here are the errors out there to be combated. Here's what it means to be Catholic. You must believe these. You cannot believe these. Of course, you have to put it in practice. And a, and a key part of how we practice that as a family, as a, as a culture, as a society, as the church, is in our worship. That's why I'm so keen on the traditional Latin mass and only the traditional Latin mass, as well as traditional devotions, as well as the traditional bravery and traditional fasting and absence, because these are the ways in which we live out that faith. So I've always said this is like a three legged stool. You know, we have the mass, we have the bravery, and I believe we have uh, fasting and absence. Those are characteristics of Catholic life. So if we don't have them all, I don't believe we actually live out the, the faith the way that our fathers do. It's something I try to make available in the Forgotten Custom series in 1 Peter 5. So the problem we find, and this is the case with, the, with actually, unfortunately, some people that I've helped catechize is they, they really love the faith when they read it. They see it and they're like, wow, look how beautiful it is. And they go to a nearby parish and they don't practice the Catholic faith. I'll be honest, they practice a Protestant faith that is not the same. They see that in the way the mass is celebrated. They see that in the reverence of receiving communion on the hand. They see that with, um, you know, they they look at it in terms of, but that is actually God himself. Why would why are people acting the way they are? Why are they talking the way they are? Why, why, why is there not the reverence? Why are people not literally falling down and to, to worship their God who is before them? And this is something I talk about in the book as well. I talk about traditional devotions often. I talk about the traditional liturgy because I, as we study the sacraments in the Roman catechism, it goes back to the way the mass was always said in the traditional Roman rite, the rite of our fathers that we have to restore. So it is true that when we have the faith, it really does need to be preceded by an outward expression of it, but they do go hand in hand. So as we learn the faith, we live it out. As we see the faith in practice, we desire to learn more about it. I believe it really is a cycle. And we can do that by encouraging more devotion, Eucharistic reparation as well, praying for more people out there who are on the fringes looking to convert, that when they do come in, they'll find the church that they've been studying, the church in all its splendor and, and in its truth. Absolutely. Uh, Shane says, could it be said that the Catholic teaching on faith and morals is vague due to an overemphasis of reading the new catechism rather than a linear reading of all catechisms. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's certainly part of uh, that, that it could be said. I do think the new catechism is really weak in a lot of areas. Now, some aspects of morality, like I said, it doesn't do a better job uh, as it as it's naming explicitly things like, for instance, in vitro fertilization that did not exist back then. So you could quote this or you can quote the air on human cloning. But while it's at least mentioning some things by name, unfortunately, I feel like the new catechism, and especially when we look at documents coming out of the Vatican for the past couple of decades, certainly for the last decade, they're so vague. They're so hard to understand. How do you apply it? Like, for instance, even a... Uh, Christ, the bearer of uh, truth, or however the exact name was, that document that came out, I believe, right after 2000 on uh, the heirs of the New Age movement. Um, that uh, that document itself, like, sure, it, it talks about the heirs of all of these different things in the space. But if I were to give that to somebody and say, I want you to understand these heirs, it's just so hard to understand. So it is vague because the new catechism, as well as the way in which documents come out today is not clear. It's not clear like the Baltimore Catechism. And, and some people fault the Baltimore Catechism for being too, uh, too short. I just want you to memorize things. But if you look at all these older catechisms, there were even longer paragraphs like the Roman Catechism. It's at least clear. You need clarity. Right. So the problem with the new catechism 
and a lot of coming out again is ambiguity. Oh, it says this, but does it mean all the time? Does it mean some of the time? And it doesn't always put it into practice. For instance, the new catechism can talk about errors that we do need to hear in regards to right, the right to life and associated issues. But does it actually go through and follow through with, here's our, therefore, moral responsibilities to vote a certain way? If it does, it obviously doesn't do much detail on it because nobody really makes that connection. Whereas that is a logical connect, connection. If something is this heinous and somebody is for it, one can never support such a person. Yeah, there's certainly a serious problem. Um, can you comment at all on the 20th century catechetical work? Because there was, um, as you you quote Leo the Thirteenth, but then Pius the Tenth also promoted catechisms and catechists and published his own catechism. And then um, the the Roman Synod of 1960 was go was going to republish the Roman Catechism. Uh, what happened to the catechism of Pius X. Why did that not become more prominent and more known? Uh, the unfortunate thing, and I can't comment exactly on, on why his catechism did, did not become as uh, common as some others, but I will say his catechism is actually more common than some other ones. For instance, Father uh, Lawrence Vaux's catechism of Christian doctrine was published in 1567. I don't hear anybody talk about that one anymore. And at its time, I feel like that was particularly well done. What about the Dewey Catechism? That was really a gold standard when it came out in 1649, when, when uh, Father Turbeville uh, wrote it. It was really modeled on this Catechism of the Council of Trent, and he, he wanted to bring it available for the purpose of helping combat English Protestantism. And at the time, it was considered the clearest English catechism ever written, in and in again, in a question and answer format. Uh, Bishop Hayes in 1781 released his own catechism. He wanted it to be more scripture focused. I feel like all of these has kind of gone out the window. Nobody talks about them. Nobody has on their shelf. I've never seen anybody use them. Uh, Father Derby wrote a catechism. He was a very, uh, it was a very accomplished German catechism. It was called a complete catechism of the Catholic religion. That was in 1847. Again, I don't hear about that one. In the mid 1800s, we really had an influx of catechisms. We had St. John Newman wrote his own catechism, and that's written by a saint. So if you want to say, okay, the other ones weren't written by a saint, you know, maybe that's why they went away. Well, his, his is, I feel, one of the least common ones, and he is a saint. We have Father Michael Mueller, we have Father Patrick Powers, Cardinal Gibbons, all writing catechisms at that time, and, and all virtually forgotten. Even when we get to 1885, we finally have the Third Council of Baltimore and the Baltimore Catechism. So that really became the gold standard at that time because it came together in a council and that was used very widely. And I feel like that uh, St. Pius X Catechism never really supplanted that one until we go to Vatican II and there's this doctrinal crisis coming. Modernism rears its head once again pushes everything else off a cliff. Everything's in flux. What does the faith mean or teach anymore? Of course, anybody who's read any of these catechisms would know dogma doesn't change, doctrine doesn't change. But um, like one of those other comments mentioned, the law of prayer is the law of belief. If now, now our way of worship changes substantially. We no longer have the same worship. We no longer revere God the same. Then people get the notion that the faith changes. That's why we have to have immutability of dogma and doctrine in, in principle, which we do, as well as in practice and how we live out our lives. Is it, if your great, great, great grandfather was here, would he look at the way you worship and say, yes, that's the Catholic faith. That was the universal faith that I was a part of on earth. And it, hopefully he's in heaven right now looking down. And if he is, is he shocked at what has happened in our world, in our church, in our families? So all of these catechisms are teaching different things uh, in terms of style but they teach the same faith. And that's why the faith and worship are so key. Now, all of them really did what I really sought to do is to make available the same faith, applying it to modern eras and the modern crisis and for the modern world. Because at the time these were written, they were all written for the modern audience. And I sought to do so here too. Thank you so much, Matthew. So in closing, can you comment on why we need your texts. And because I think of the 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 as you said, the Pius X Catechism never really became so universalized. And Vatican II happens 62 to 65. 
And then there is this infamous Dutch catechism, which actually promoted heresy, and it was uh, promulgated by the Dutch bishops. So this is an official mm. church catechism, which contains heresy, which provoked a response from the Holy See. And Paul VI did not, he, he should have really anathematized it, but instead he, he simply published his cr the creed of Paul VI, which is, which is just a, a creed which confirms Orthodox doctrine. But it's a rather short statement, um, and there's been this this uh, rebellion from even priests and some bishops ever since against that doctrine as well as Humanae Vitae. And finally, the new catechism comes out decades later, sort of decades too late, really, and it doesn't even address all the situation. Um, can you comment at all? Why why is your book so necessary for this particular time in this situation? So that's a good question. I think it goes back to one of the first questions you asked, uh, and it, it really went into which catechism was, what is the Roman catechism? You know, and I said it was the most definitive catechism. It is the catechism. It is the original one. It is the one put forth by the fathers at the Council of Trent. So while we could say, you know, here is, you know, the Darby Catechism, here's the Dewey Catechism, simply reappropriated to modern disciplines, I don't think that gets at the crux of it, that the Catechism of the Council of Trent was the official catechism. And we've gotten so far from that, rather than issuing, here's a creed, here's a statement of combat, what is an actually a heretical text? Let's go back to, that was the catechism. Now, unfortunately, like we talked about, that catechism is over 600 pages. It's not approachable for the modern modern Catholic, modern DRE, modern priest, the modern parent, modern individual. So how do we make it available? We take it, we take the paragraphs out, we supplant them with some of these other historical catechisms, and we make it available in a language today that makes sense to you, that you can skim through, that you can read, and that you can apply to the actual crisis we're in today. So this book is necessary, I do believe, because it seeks to make available, again, the Roman Catechism. That is the Catechism of St. Pius V, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which has fallen completely out of use. And it's time to assert that the new Catechism of 1992 is not the Catechism. It is not the only Catechism. It is not the official Catechism set forth by an actually ecumenical council that sought to define doctrine. So that's why it's so necessary. Yeah, I, th I think what you just said is the perfect way to say it. It's really the catechism seeking to dogmatize doctrine, which is not like Vatican II, which is seeking to dialogue with, with the modern world. And we can debate about whether or not that was a good thing. But the, the fact remains that nobody can really argue with is that Trent sought to dogmatize the faith against Protestant heresies. And as long as we still have Protestantism around, the Roman Catechism will still be highly relevant, uh, highly uh, definitive. Um, and so I think that that's that's a great way to uh, bring out why your text is so important, because we need to get reconnected with the Roman Catechism. And your book is what helps us get reconnected, I think, especially for a Protestant convert. I'm a Protestant convert. I, I was Protestant, then I was Eastern Orthodox, then I was Catholic, Catholic mm. uh, especially as a Protestant convert. Uh, wanting to connect with the Roman catechism really is meaningful and important for Protestants because Protestant converts want to shed their Protestantism. They don't mm -hmm. want to continue to be Protestant in sort of a wishy-washy halfway way that many Catholic parishes today want, as you said. They Many Catholic parishes want to have sort of this halfway Protestantism to try to draw on the Protestants. Well, Protestant converts don't want that. We want mm -hmm. to be Catholic. We want to stop being Protestants. That's why we left, you know. Yeah. So uh, I, I really am thankful, uh, Matthew, for you writing this text. Thank you so much. Everybody, make sure to go and buy this. It's a great gift for a new Catholic, a revert Catholic for, for Christmas. Uh, great thing to buy for your local RCA, RCIA, or, or whatever catechetical program you have at your parish uh, to give these as a guide for instruction in the faith. Um, so let me see. Oh, traditional Thomist says, I don't know of almost any better online blog than a Catholic life. So yes, I, I, I very much uh, agree with that. I, like I said, just, just presenting the faith, 
We don't need That's to. That's what I to do. Yeah. yeah because absolutely. you want to know the faith in order to present it. So like you just said, you want to shed your Protestantism. Well, how do you do that? You become Catholic. Well, what is the Catholic faith? What does it teach? I don't need ambiguity to, I read these dense paragraphs. I'm like, I'm not sure what I read. I want to read, this is the faith. These are what Catholics believe. This is why we believe it. We have always done it this way because our Lord himself taught it. That's what you want. And that's what we've sought to make available. So you said the book's available for sale. It is. It's available for sale on Amazon and paperback as well as the Kindle edition. And then um, at this time, too, I, I do have a PDF of it as well. So if somebody did want to support my blog, the Catholic Life blog, and become a member of my Patreon channel, uh, you can find a link to do so on a catholic life on the sidebar if you join and sign up as a patreon member at the ten dollar tier or higher um you do get a copy of the pdf for free so um the ten dollar level or higher you'll get a copy of this and you actually get several other books that i've authored as well over the years as well as some other benefits too so it's a way to support my work and my research that i that i do to you know in these articles to make available the traditional disciplines of the church Fasting and absence, holy days, as has been my focus for the past two years. I also am working uh, with a number of religious orders right now to try to teach them some of these traditional disciplines. I'm trying to do what I can to really build up society using the gifts that you know I have. And I'm thankful for everybody who who has uh, reached out, who supports me, supports my channels and my work. So this book is really uh, um four years in the making. So thank you as well for everybody who's prayed for it, because I have asked people to pray for the success of my writings over the years. So I do thank everybody who's done so. Yes, please uh, go to patreon.com slash a Catholic life. Support Matthew in his good work. So we'll, we'll end this. Thanks, Matthew, for your time. We'll, we'll as we always do, with, a, with an Ave Maria. And we'll invoke our patrons here at uh, 1 Peter 5, and we'll also invoke St. Charles Borromeo whom you invoked throughout the writing of this, this text. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. Blessed Emperor Carl. Pray for us. Saint Maximilian Kolbe. Pray for us. Saint Charles Borromeo. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King.